What's up guys, Grumass here, and I'm looking through my statistics on my DIY LED Basics Part 1. There is a tremendous drop off in viewership from Part 1 to Part 2, and this video has more dislikes than any of my other videos combined. Also in the comments, you guys said that this is not basic enough. It assumes that you know too much. So if you're listening to the sound of my voice right now and you're watching this video, and you are a complete noob to LEDs and electronics, this video will attempt to give you the foundations and the basics and define the terms that you're going to need to build your own DIY LED grow light. So check this out and please let me know if you guys have any questions, you need anything clarified in the comment section of this video. Thanks for watching. So let's start with defining some basic terms and I don't want to get bogged down with the physics and being too technical so I'll just run through them really quickly. LED stands for light emitting diode. It has some positive stuff on one side and some negative stuff on the other. And when you put electricity through it, it makes light. COB stands for chip on board LED. It's 100 or sometimes 150 little bitty LEDs that are integrated onto a ceramic circuit board or sometimes a copper, copper circuit board that are all wired together so they have one common positive and one common negative. It does all the work for you and just gives you this one chip. So that's what a cob is and that's the focus of my YouTube channel and the entire video series. So it's important to understand what a cob is. A watt is a unit of consumption. It's how much the electricity company charges you for your lights in your grow room. And all a watt is, it's a lot like inches and centimeters. They both describe a distance on a ruler. Watts kind of the same thing. A watt is one joule of energy consumed over one second. So a thousand watts is equal to a kilowatt and a thousand watts used in 60 minutes is a kilowatt hour. That's how they're charging you. Now voltage in an LED is the difference in charge between the positive and the negative. So for this Cree cob, the potential difference or the difference is 36 volts. What that means is it means that this cob takes 36 volts to turn it on. 35 volts isn't enough, 34 volts isn't enough. It needs a minimum of 36 volts to turn on. Now, what if you have 37 or 50 volts? Is that gonna overdrive the cob? The answer is no, it doesn't really matter. The cob can see 30 volts, 40 volts, 50 volts. As long as it has 36, it'll turn on. The brightness is determined by the amperage or the current. And that's measured typically in amps. But we talk a lot about milliamps. A thousand milliamps is equal to one amp. This is how strong the LEDs will be. This is how bright they'll be. This will determine how much power they, they will pull from the wall and how powerful they will be. So current is everything when it comes to the brightness of the LED. To get that brightness, you need what's called an LED driver. An LED driver is very similar to an HPS ballast or a metal halide ballast. All it does is regulate the voltage and the amperage to the LED, it just regulates the power. And here is um, an example of a driver here. This is a mean wheel driver, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, last term that we're gonna be talking about is the heat sink, and all this is is the substance you mount the LEDs to that gets rid of excess heat. Now, when we talk about heat sinks, there's a couple different types. I think it's important to talk about what active versus what passive means. An active heat sink means that there's a chunk of metal, whether it's aluminum or copper, and has some fins, and there is a fan using electricity that's actively blowing air over it, actively cooling it. So we'll talk about this more in part three of the series, but this is an active heat sink. A passive heat sink is a heat sink that relies only on the fins or the pins to cool it. So you've got a circulation fan in your room, that's providing the cooling to the LED. Or if it's stagnant, the, L the heat sink is just radiating out passively. Um, no electricity is used. So that's important when I say active versus passive. Okay, so now that we've got our terms defined and hopefully we're all speaking the same language, I want to keep this really basic. So if you're watching this video, you might be a grower, a cannabis grower, or a succulent, or a microgreens grower, and you've heard about LED technology, or maybe you use an off-the-shelf LED, and you've seen some of these DIY builds and you just want to understand the components so that you can select them or you can have someone select them for you and you can assemble it. So for drivers, what do you really care about? I'll admit, all these numbers and all this crap on here is pretty intimidating for a first time user. So there's really only 
two or three things that you actually care about when it comes to a driver. Let me go ahead and zoom in on this one here. So this is a Meanwell HLG 185 C700. Now it says 185 but really this is a 200 watt driver and that's what this is referring to here and this is the drive current. Now if you look at the fine print you've got an input which is where you plug it into the wall. Now you'll notice that most high-end drivers or even medium-end drivers are universal input. That means the plug-in that you plug into the wall you can put, if you live in Germany, Canada, China, the USA, it doesn't really matter, just put your standard wall plug end on to it and the driver will figure it out. It can accept anything from 100 volts up to 240 volts AC. So that's most countries that I'm aware of, you know. So just, uh, like I said, put a plug on it and it's going to plug in fine for whatever country, you know, you're in uh, for the most part. Now, the output is what we're really um, concerned about and it's what really confuses people. And on this driver, the output gives you two numbers. It says 286V, right here, 0.7A. So from our defined terms, we know that, we, that this driver supplies 286 DC volts at a strength of 0.7 amps or 700 milliamps. So, When selecting a driver, if it's not a mean well, if it's like an Inventronics, or if it's one of the ones on eBay, all you have to look for is input voltage. Will that match your country's voltage? And in most cases, I'm saying yes. The output voltage tells you how many cobs or how many LEDs you are going to want to run. Now, if it doesn't say the voltage on the front of the driver, which is fairly rare, but if it doesn't, you can go to the manufacturer's website, look up the product number, and they're going to have a spec sheet or a PDF nine times out of ten that's going to give you these statistics. So this driver has 286 volts out. All you have to do to find out how many LEDs this will run, regardless of the strength, is take the total voltage available, this is the bank of voltage, and divide that by the voltage of each individual LED. So let's say we had an LED that uses 2.86 volts each, like the little LEDs um, that you've seen, 3 watt LEDs. That means that this driver will run 100 LEDs. Okay. Alternatively, let's say you had a cob or something, or you know something a little bit larger that uses 28.6 volts per unit. That means this will run 10 cobs or 10 larger LEDs. Okay, so that just tells you the quantity. Now, when you're when you're dealing with drivers and turning LEDs on, if you have a string of LEDs wired in series, if you don't have enough voltage to run all 10 LEDs, then none of them will turn on. So for example, if we had a string with 11 cobs on them, none of them would turn on because there's not enough voltage to get back to the driver. So that's pretty important. Now, when it comes to the amperage, this particular driver is 0 0.7 amps, which is the same as saying 700 milliamps. That is the strength that this driver will drive the LEDs. Now, assuming that you've selected a driver already, now you, you, can, you can select your components one of two ways. You can select the LEDs based on the space and the coverage, or you can select the drivers based on a deal that you got or what you have available. Selecting the cobs or selecting the LEDs, there's only two things you care about really when it comes to an LED. Number one, what is its forward voltage, abbreviated FV? For most of the Crees and most of the newer cobs, that's going to be 36 volts. That is the minimum number of volts that the LED needs to emit light. Without it, it's not going to emit light at all. The second thing is what is its maximum current that it can take. A lot of these are 3.6 amps. That means if you supply 3.7 amps to this LED, it will blow, it will fry, it will catch on fire. Now, with LEDs and drivers, 
the whole motivation or goal of, of doing this hobby and getting into this is efficiency. Okay? Now what efficiency means, it's a ratio of photons of light energy to heat. Okay? Now in the past we've seen with uh, HPS we've had a ratio of 35% photons to 65% heat. But with LEDs we can flip this around. We can get 65% photons to 35% heat. That's our yield. We're, we're, we're using the same amount of energy but we're yielding more photons and that's the whole goal for this. Now of the three major components to any build, drivers, the cobs, and the heat sinks, the heat sink seems to be what people are having the most trouble with, calculating and sizing the heat sinks for their application. Now, active versus passive is something I talk a lot, a lot about in the series and I'll tell you right now. A passive heat sink is going to be more efficient because you're going to save the 5 to 10 watts that the computer fan that cools an active heat sink is going to use. So a lot of people are wanting to lean to passive, but they have to be basically four times larger than an active heat sink, and so that's a lot of weight and that's a lot of expense, and you need to calculate it fairly precisely. Now the calculations that I offer in part three are a very simplified method to calculating heat sink sizes. It doesn't take into account the thermal resistance of different heat sink materials, for example, um, the calculations I provide are basically just for a raw extruded heat sink. Um, if you go with a heat sink like this, this is black anodized. So the anodization process seals the aluminum and keeps oxidation from forming, which uh, increases its ability to get rid of heat. Um, also has a, a little more efficient pin design. So you could use a, a smaller anodized pin heat, heat sink to do the same job as a larger extruded thin heat sink. So here's what I'll tell you. If you're a beginner, go for active. Active is going to give you the safety net. It's going to give you more cooling than you need. If you're going to go with passive, I will offer you one sort of um, cookie cutter build. If you go to heatsinkusa.com and you get between a 36 inch to a 42 inch heat sink of their 5.886 inch wide profile. This is their, this is their uh, probably one of their more popular profiles, just under six inches, and it's got about 10 fins on it. This particular model has enough surface area to dissipate around 200 watts, and you can safely do that here. It's, when you're sizing a passive heat sink, it is critical, but what you have to remember with Cree and with uh, most cobs is that they their efficiency is rated at 25 C and so a lot of the numbers you're seeing online is at this operating temperature but they will run all the way up to 85 C which is a massive temperature difference so if you're off by an inch or two here you're going to be running maybe slightly warmer than the 25 or 30 C, but you're not going to notice any significant drop in your efficiency. So don't, you know, don't get too hung up on heat sink sizes um, and don't let that discourage you from the process. Now, the other thing that people are struggling to understand is how one driver relates to another driver. So for this, um, I talk a lot about the Meanwell HLG series, so I'll talk specifically about it. The Meanwell HLG 185 is a series of 200 watt drivers, regardless of the drive current, whether it's 300 milliamps or 1700 milliamps, they all have the ability to put out 200 watts or consume 200 watts. And I have these glasses of water to demonstrate how they do it in the relationship between them. The glasses themselves, just imagine them as the 200 watt driver. The water that's inside, the actual volume, the amount of water, is the amount of voltage that each driver supplies. And the color of the water is the current, the strength. You'll notice down here we have a really blood red liquid. That's because this driver will drive the LEDs the strongest. An LED hooked up to this driver will put out the most light per individual LED. And I've created this little chart and I'll explain how it works basically. So 
If you'll notice here, I'm talking about the 185 HLG C700. So its drive strength is 700 milliamps, okay? You'll notice it has the most water because it has 286 volts available. That means it can drive eight cobs if we're talking 36 volt kind of standard cobs like a Cree or something like that. You'll notice that the liquid is also the lightest. That means that each cob will be run the softest, okay? We go to the next one. This is the HLG 185C1050. You'll notice it's kind of in between. It's a sort of an orangish red color because it drives it sort of a middle strength at 1050 milliamps. It has 179 volts, so you notice the volume of water is kind of halfway in the middle, and it'll run five cops. The final driver, and this one is about the best balance of efficiency and upfront cost. This is the 185C1400. It also puts out 200 watts. You notice that it has the least volume of water because it has the least voltage available. It also runs the least cobs at 143 volts. Divide that by four, it'll run four cobs. But it runs each individual cob the strongest. The softer you run an LED, the more efficient it'll be. That means that the ratio of photons to heat will be higher in favor of the photons. So if you run an LED at 700 milliamps, you'll get a ratio of you know, 60 to 65% photons, 35% heat. If you run a cob at 1000 milliamps, you'll get about 60% photons, 40% heat. And if you run at 1400 milliamps, you'll get around 56% photons and 44% heat. So there's not a huge discrepancy in here as far as efficiency is concerned, but there is a big cost um, difference in the different drivers and the different drive setups. To get 200 watts out of this driver, you need to purchase eight cobs. So if those are 40 bucks a piece, that's 320 bucks worth of cobs. To get the same 200 watts here, you only need five cobs, which is going to be 200 bucks. And over here, it's going to be about 160 bucks because you only need four cobs. All of these setups will give you 200 watts at the wall, but the highest yield of photons, the most amount of plant usable photons for growth, will be out of the highest efficiency setup. That's why some people choose to invest the additional money and drive the softer drive current for more LEDs. Now, let's use this concept of the volume equaling the voltage available and the strength equaling the current to do a quick example of how this all works together, how drivers and cobs and wiring all works together so you can see it uh, for yourself. Okay guys, for this demonstration, I have a piece of tube and you can imagine this as a heat sink. And inside of it, I have four sponges. Imagine those as the cobs. And it's a really good representation because a cob or any LED is just like a sponge. It is a sponge for voltage, okay? So I've grabbed the cup here that demonstrates the Meanwell HLG 185-1400. And it's got a volume of liquid in it. And we're going to see by pouring this liquid, the liquid is the voltage, if we have enough volts to get through all the sponges, through all the cobs, if we can successfully fire four cobs, the voltage will soak through, the water will soak through the sponge and go to the second, the third, and the fourth, and we should be left with a little bit of water at the end. That will demonstrate to us that this setup with this driver and these LEDs will work because we've got enough voltage to flow through all the LEDs back to the driver. Okay guys, so we start pouring the water into the top of this demonstration. Imagine the driver's plugged in and it's distributing voltage to the LEDs. If this setup is correct, if it's got enough voltage, all four sponges should be wet and we should see some liquid at the bottom of the cup, which we are. That means that this setup works. We have enough voltage to turn on all four LEDs. Now let's take a look at the same type of setup, but this one theoretically will not work. So we're using the same 1400 milliamp driver with 143 volts, same amount of water. We're gonna pour it into this tube representing the heat sink that has six sponges or six cobs in it. And as you can see from this demonstration, it's plenty to light up the first cob, it's plenty to light up the second, but 
if no water gets through to the end of the cup, none of the LEDs will turn on, period. So I'll speed that up and we'll see the result. So as you can see, sped up, plenty of voltage for the first three, the first four, but we get it, when it gets to that fifth, it's not quite enough voltage to completely saturate that fifth and go to that sixth cob. So since there's no water underneath, what that means is that this string will not work. It's too many cobs, too many sponges for this particular driver. Well guys, that just about wraps it up for this series. I hope that this was basic enough. I really made a sincere attempt to imagine what it was like back when I first started this, how overwhelming it was, how uh, it didn't even seem like the same language. I still want you guys building your own LEDs, specking your own components, designing, innovating, doing all that kind of cool stuff. But for you guys out there that just want to buy something that works, a kit, so you can get all the savings of DIY in an easy to assemble kit without having to do any of the calculations or any of that stuff, I'm partnered with Cutter Electronics, cutter.com.au, to bring you guys a MAL5 DIY kit. I'm not making any money off of this stuff. You can buy it or you can buy your own components. It doesn't make any difference to me. But if you want the ease of selecting components, check back here at cutter.com.au around the middle of March 2016. And as always, keep checking back on my YouTube channel and I will bring you guys a video demonstration of this kit, how to assemble it, and how to configure it for your grow space. Thanks again for watching, guys, and I'll see you on the next video.